I'd like to pray primarily this morning for revelation. This is the most important thing I believe that can come out of a conference like this, is that you personally receive revelation. I'm here as a servant, as a messenger, okay? But the message is not my own. The message is a message of God's word. And in order to receive God's word, we need one thing. We need a revelation from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when he opens up our understanding and enlightens the inner man or woman. So it's when the light of God's word shines not into or just into our mind, but into the inner parts of our being and begins to speak to us, each one of us, personally. That is the most important thing that can possibly happen today. And so I'd like to pray that the eyes of our understanding will be opened, will be enlightened, that we'll be able to perceive by the spirit the, the length and the depth, the height, the, uh, the, all the dimensions of what God wants to show us. Bible truth is not just one-dimensional, okay? It's, and it's not even two-dimensional, okay? It has a height, it has a, it has a, a width, but there's a depth to it. Bible truth is a, is a landscape that we, that we understand. You know, like, let's say you were to um, um, go to a, a painter, okay, a painter's studio, and a painter would paint you a picture, okay, and uh, you know, a picture that's painted on canvas has two dimensions, okay, it's, it's tall and it's wide, okay, but it's flat. But there's something about Bible truth. It gives you the height, it gives you the width, and then there's a depth to it. So Bible truth invites you to enter into it, okay? It's a landscape in which you can walk, okay? So you begin to enter into truth. You begin to live in truth. That's what I'd like to pray at the beginning of today's session. So could we do that? Let's just bow our heads. Lord, we just thank you. You are the God of revelation. You speak to us by revelation. It's by revelation that we see Jesus Christ. It's by revelation that we're saved. It's by the, the miracle of your word working something deep, spiritually in our hearts, so that once we've seen it, we know it to be true. And we are able to enter into that truth and walk in that truth and live that truth. It becomes reality to us. Lord, I pray that that revelation, that revelatory understanding would be granted to us today. Give us grace. Give me grace to be clear and articulate with your truth. Give my brothers and sisters sitting in this room today the grace to hear, to see, to understand in the spirit and to enter into truth. We pray, Lord, for your presence to be here, that you would honor your word with your presence, that the love of Jesus would be shed abroad in our hearts and that you would move through this group today, each one of us, and touch each one of us, personalize your word to us. We ask it today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Today's first message is about the choices that God makes. Because the first thing in understanding Israel's place in Revelation is uh, to deal with the fact that Israel is unique, Israel is worthy of your study because Israel was chosen by God. Okay, that is the reason. There's nothing superior about Israel. There's nothing better about the Jewish people. The fact is only that they were chosen by God for a particular role. And we must reconcile ourselves to that fact about the way God deals with his world by making choices. Now, Israel was chosen for a purpose. And we'll return to this theme again and, and again today but Israel was chosen to be a light to the world. Israel as a people, as a nation, was never chosen for herself alone. It wasn't to be a club. It became a club, okay? The Pharisees were, were, were club members, okay? And uh, they were an affront to God, okay? God's choosing was never to create an elite uh, people that were separate from the people of the world, God always intended for his people to be a blessing to all nations. You can see this most clearly if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, and let's read verses 1, 2, and 3. First book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, if you look in verses 1, 2, and 3, you can see from the call of Abraham that it was always God's plan that his truth would go to the ends of the earth 
Israel was chosen as God's instrument of bringing that truth to you and me. And Israel was held accountable for that choice that God made. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I'll make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God said, Abram, I'm choosing you. I found in you a man who have a steadfast heart, a man of faith. I'm going to make a covenant with you, which is an unbreakable promise on God's part. And I'm calling you to leave that which is familiar, leave your home, your relatives, leave everything that you know about, and go to the land which I will show you. Okay, so Abram and his people and the land, it's, it's, a, it's an inseparable part of God's covenant. And that should give, begin to give us insight into the conflict over the land of Israel that's even going on today, thousands of years later. God made a promise to this man, Abram. He says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. Millions of people will know your name. And so it has been throughout the years. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to be on your side. I'm going to fight against your enemies. Your friends will be my friends. Your enemies will be my enemies. That's what God said. How would you like a promise like that from God? Okay. God's going to back you up. Okay. This is what he said to Abram. And it was not just light words. These were, these were covenantal words. This was a promise, an unbreakable promise from God. But at the end of verse 3, God makes a simple statement, and in it you have the purposes of God. God is not just making friends with Abram because he likes the way he parts his hair. Okay? He's not making friends with Abram because he's, he, just, he wants a companion or he's lonely or anything like that. Okay? God has said this and made this covenant with Abram that lasts throughout the generations because he has a purpose. God has a purpose in mind. What's God's purpose? Look in the end of verse 3. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram, don't, don't ever think that this is for you alone. Don't ever get arrogant. Don't ever get prideful. Don't ever think that I've chosen you for you. I've chosen you, Abram, and I will make you great for my reasons. And my reasons involve every other person on the planet. You will be my servant to bless them. Your people will be a servant people to bless them. You will be a light not unto yourself, you will be a light to the nations. So I want to start at the very beginning that we understand that we're not talking about favoritism on God's part. We're not talking about superiority. We're talking about a nation that was chosen to serve the other nations. This is the same God who said, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It was always God's intention to redeem the world. And he chose Abram as his instrument, as his means to bring about his purposes throughout all the families of the earth. Throughout the Bible, God judged Israel based on her obedience and her willingness to perform his purposes. Okay, Israel was called for this. Israel was, was cultivated for this. Israel at some times succeeded and many times failed. But God never broke his promise to her. And he never changed his mind about his purposes for her because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Okay, he doesn't change his mind. And the lesson for us is this is the same for every single one of us, for you and for me. God chooses us for a reason, okay? Jesus reveals to us in the New Testament, you didn't choose me, I chose you. If you are in the kingdom today, if you know that Jesus is Lord, that's not an accident. God came to you. He selected you. He gave you the grace and the revelation to know that, to be saved. He gave you salvation for a reason. And we need to be about our Father's purposes. We need to understand those reasons. And by learning about Israel, you learn the kindness and the severity of God. You learn the blessing. You learn the power of God.
But you also learn the responsibility and the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is good, by the way. It's the beginning of wisdom. Okay? We learn that we are going to be accountable for him, just as Israel was accountable. God would say to Israel, are you doing it? Are you being a light to the nations? Or are you only concerned about yourselves? Are you, are you glad that I've given you the, the law? Are you glad that I've given you the priesthood? Are you glad that I've given you the temple, that my presence is in your midst, that I've chosen your city, Jerusalem, as a city for my dwelling place? Are you glad about that? And everybody would say, oh yeah, we're glad about that. Okay, now go out and preach the gospel and change the world. Oh, well, that's another thing, okay? <laughs> that's another thing. Okay, so, and each one of us, it's like that. If we've received grace from God, we have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have God dwelling inside of us. We have the unfathomable riches of the Lord given to us by, as a gift of grace. But there comes a responsibility and an accountability with that. We will all stand before our master and have to give an account for what we have done in this life, whether good or whether evil. And we long to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I said this in the previous conference, and I'll say it again. Woe unto the believer who stands before the Lord on that last day, and the Lord says, did you do? Did you do it? Woe unto the believer that says, do what? <laughs> what, what was it, Lord, that you wanted? You know, I, I really wanted to know, okay? We need to be about our Father's business. Let's find out, okay? And Israel, I believe, is a key. It's a, it's a revelatory key for coming in to the center of God's purposes. Okay, now, the first thing we need to understand about God and his kingdom is that he's a king. There's no kingdom without the king. And so in the kingdom of God, God rules with sovereignty, okay? In fact, you could say that that is where the kingdom of God exists. Is the kingdom coming in the future? Yes. Is the kingdom here in our hearts? Yes. Okay, so what is the kingdom? The kingdom is wherever and whenever the king is ruling. Okay? So if the king is ruling in your life, you have the kingdom of God. When the Messiah comes and establishes his throne on earth, he will rule. Then the kingdom will come. But it's also here now. Do you see what I'm saying? The most important fact about the kingdom is that there's a king. And the king, this king, rules. He's not a faraway, disinterested um, cosmic force. Okay, as some people believe, oh, yeah, I think, I think maybe there's a God, but if there's a God, he's out there somewhere. Okay, and he has very little to do with, with my life. God isn't like that. When you come into the kingdom, you realize very shortly, if you're genuinely born again, that God is an up close and personal in your face kind of God. He, he desires intimacy in the inward parts. He wants an intimate relationship with us. He wants to be our father. He wants to be our friend. He wants to be our brother. He wants to be close. And he wants to begin to speak to us. And he'll begin to tell us things that we should do, okay? Because of this, many of us struggle with God. Not many of us, all of us. Come on, let's be honest today. All of us struggle with God. When he comes into our life, he starts to change things. We say, Lord, wait a minute. I thought this was about being blessed. Okay? He says, yeah, I'm blessing you. I'm straightening you out. Okay? I'm going to tell you the right way to live. I'm going to give you wisdom. Okay? And, and as we mature, as we become disciples, we learn to yield because he's the king. I mean, that's what it's about. Okay? We, we serve a Lord. This is not... The kingdom of heaven is not democracy, okay? It's not committee, okay? It's, it's the king, the perfect ruler, pure, the purest and highest form of love itself, embodied in our sovereign. He knows what's best. He gave his life for us. He proves his love to us. We follow him because of that, but he's a king. So we need to, we need to deal with God's choices, and in approaching the understanding about Israel, this, this thing of God's choice is so important. Many people stumble over understanding Israel because they stumble over God's choosing. I, know, I speak to many Christians. They say, well, yeah, you know, 
what is this, what is this you're trying to tell us about Israel? You know, isn't, it, isn't this some kind of favoritism? Or, you know, are you trying to say that God you know, considers them better than all the rest of the people? And I'm saying, no, you have to understand, it's a matter of choice. If you can get that, then the riches of understanding that Israel offers can be given to you if you understand that they were simply chosen. God chooses throughout the Bible. He's the kind of ruler who is a very good and wise manager. Okay, what manager is there among you who manages without choosing? Okay, if you're a manager, you know your whole thing, your whole, your whole reason for, for existence is to make good choices. You have to choose this person for that job, and it better be right. You have to choose about, make decisions about finance. Decision and making and choosing, it's the same thing. And God is the same. He's a wise and efficient manager. He makes choices, and the Bible is a record of the major choices that he's made. Let me give you an example. From the very beginning, two brothers brought offerings to the Lord, Cain and Abel. They both brought offerings, and the book of Genesis records for us that God chose between their offerings. He said, I like Abel's offerings. Abel, your offering is acceptable to me. Cain, it's not good. In fact, the Bible doesn't even tell us what were the criteria. Obviously, there were some criteria, but he, he, chose, he chose Abel's, he rejected Cain's, okay? I don't think Cain felt so good about that. In fact, it led to the first murder in the Bible, okay? He was jealous of his brother, but it, it was a matter of, of God's making a choice. How about in the time of the kings? There was a, a young man named David that God simply chose. David will be my next king. I rejected Saul. Okay, I've taken the kingdom from the house of Saul. It will now go to the house of Jesse and his son David. David will reign on my throne. Now listen, if you had lived in those days in, in Israel, maybe your family would have had connections to the house of Saul. You would have had maybe some political connections or business connections. And you would have, you would have wanted Saul and Jonathan to can stay on the throne for your own, for your own purposes. Okay? But listen, if God, when you, the day you learned that God anointed David would be the day you'd have to choose, am I going to go with God or not? Okay, there was a civil war fought in Israel over that choice. Okay, so the Bible is a record of God's making choices, and God has chosen Israel for a particular purpose. And if we want to understand God's purposes and begin to flow in that, we have to somehow recognize that choice and reconcile ourselves to that choice. I'd like to give you a couple examples from scriptures of non-Jews who wrestled with that choice of Israel and the results of their, of their wrestling, okay? Where they came to in that. So for the first example, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. And let's take a look at a great man, a general, a man uh, from the nation of Syria. 2 Kings chapter 5, and let's begin looking in verse 1. Now, in those days, Syria was a bitter enemy of Israel's. And things haven't changed much since then until now. Okay, we still don't get along very well with our Syrian neighbors. Okay, we've got a lot of differences with them. But in those days, Syria was the dominant military and political force in the region, in our region, in the Middle East. The, they were known as the kingdom of Aram, okay? And they, and they just dominated everything. Everybody was in fear of them, including the nation of Israel. In those days, Israel was kind of like a small country under the, the military and political influence, okay, of Syria or Aram. And the man who had brought this about, who had made his kingdom so mighty, was this general named Naaman, okay? Naaman was a commander of the Syrian army, he was, uh, he was a right-hand man to his king, and he was very powerful. He was very honored. He had riches. He had, uh, he had uh, honor. He had all the privileges that a, a great man would have in his country, but he had one problem. He was a leper, and they had no cure for leprosy. And so all the doctors and all the physicians of Damascus attended to him. All the, what, had all the wealth that, and all the influence that he possibly, possibly could need, but he still couldn't find a cure. So let's just take a look at, um, at his story. Look in verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, 
but he was a leper. Verse 2, now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, then he would cure him of his leprosy. Okay, so here's the story. The, the Syrians would go out and they would make military raids on the, on the territory of Israel because they had, the, uh, they had the power to do it. And on one of those raids, they took a young uh, Israeli girl captive and they carried her back to Damascus and she became a servant in the house of Naaman. Okay, she waited on, on Naaman's, Naaman's wife. Now, Naaman was a leper. Now, something about this Israeli servant girl who is a, a captive, a, a, basically a prisoner in a foreign land, she apparently loves this man, Naaman. I mean, there, maybe there was something about him in, in, in his household, okay? And, and she was obviously treated with kindness because she, she looks towards this man, Naaman, almost like a father figure, and she says to the, to the wife of Naaman, oh, I wish that my master could be cured of his leprosy if he only knew about the prophet that is in Israel, in Samaria, okay? I'm sure that he would be healed, okay? So uh, word gets around the palace, okay? It just got, you know, word of mouth, a little bit of gossip. And eventually, Naaman hears about this, okay? Not only Naaman hears about it, but the king of, of Syria hears about it. He hears that there's a possible cure for his great general, but it's not in Damascus, it's in the land of Israel. So the king, as the story goes, and you can, you can read this later, as the story goes, the king of Syria writes a letter to the king of Israel, Okay, and in the letter it says, I'm the king of Syria, and uh, I, have, I have a demand of you today. I want you to cure my servant Naaman. I'm going to send him to you. Okay. And according to the Bible, when the king of Israel read the letter, he got upset. How do we know that he got upset? It says he tore his clothes. Okay, that means he got upset. Okay, so he tore his clothes. He had a fright, okay? And what he says is, this is a trick. Okay, the king, what am I, God, to heal, you know, heal his general? Okay, I'm just a king. I think, and, it, and he thought that the king of Syria was looking for some provocation okay, to start another war okay, so he could come back into Israel and conquer some more. So he was upset. Okay, but the word then gets out of, you know, I don't know how they did it in those days. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have, you know... <laughs> you know, messaging or anything like that. You know, anyway, the word got around, and eventually the word comes to Elisha, the prophet, okay, in Samaria, the Israel, Israel's prophet, okay? And, and he hears uh, that his king is upset, and so he sends a message to the king. Why has the king torn his clothes? In other words, calm down, okay? <laughs> Send Naaman to me, and God will heal him, okay? So then, then the word gets back to the king, and it gets back to the king of Syria, and finally it gets back to Naaman, okay? So Naaman says, okay, go all the way over there, okay, to see a prophet, you know, um, really, I, I don't think he really had a lot of faith in this, okay, I don't think he was really, really uh, excited about the idea, but the instructions had come from his king, okay, and he was a man under authority, that was clear, so he gets his, his retinue together, he gets his soldiers, and he gets his, his uh, whole chariots, and they bring a whole group of them, and they come across the border, they come through the Galilee, they come all the way, probably, well, we think, I'm from Mount Carmel, so we think that he came to Mount Carmel. Okay. Okay, so he came to our part of Israel, okay, and he knocks on the door of the prophet. Okay, after all of this, all of this uh, messaging and rumors and, and word of mouth, okay, he comes to the door of the prophet. Now here's what happens. 2 Kings uh, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger saying to him, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. Simple. Okay? He comes all this way, he gets a simple instruction, you know, like, take two aspirin, okay? <laughs> Go home, you're going to be fine, all right? Dip seven times in the Jordan, and you're well. That's it. Now, you'd think maybe he would have been happy about that. Oh, okay, so it's not, not such a big deal anyway. But he wasn't happy about this. Why wasn't he happy? Because he was a great man from a great nation. He had come at great expense all the way to this little foreign country, okay, to seek out this prophet. And you know what? The prophet himself didn't even come to see him. You know, didn't even, the prophet sends his servant out. The servant says, the prophet says, dip seven times in the Jordan, you'll be okay. 
All right? So Naaman doesn't like this, and you'll see this in the next verse. Look in verse 11. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the place, and cure the leper. I mean, at least he wanted a worship service. Okay? <laughs> He wanted the elders. He wanted the deacons. Okay, you know, he wanted them to come out and anoint him, and, and he wanted some type of religious ceremony. That's what he came expecting. And so when the servant comes out and tells him to go, basically just to go away, he doesn't like it. Okay? Now, I think the reason he was so angry and why he wanted a religious celebration or religious service was because he came without any faith whatsoever. He really didn't believe he was going to get healed. So at least he wanted to go back to Damascus and say, well, they'd say, well, did you get healed? Did, you know, what happened? Did you, did you see the prophet? Oh, yes, the prophet came out and all his men and all of the singers and the musicians and everything like that, and, and they blew the shofar, <laughs> you know, and, and they, they waved their hands over me and they prayed this incredible prayer. It was fabulous, but no, no, I didn't get healed, but it was, it was really fabulous, okay? See what I'm saying? He wanted, he wanted to be able to take back something because he didn't expect that he was going to go back healed. Then what else does he have to say? Look at verse 12. Are not Arbana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. So basically this general saying, listen, I come from Damascus. We've got rivers there. In fact, our rivers are better than the rivers here. Okay? Our rivers are, are big, you know, and our rivers are close. And there, anyway, there are rivers. Why did I have to come all the way here to go into that river? Now, listen, I come from Israel, and we are very proud of our Jordan River. Okay? I mean, it's a biblical river after all. Okay? And uh, we don't have many rivers in Israel. Okay? I mean, we hardly have any, to tell you the truth. Okay? But to be really honest with you, the Jordan River, it's not such an impressive river, okay? I mean, it's not, you know, like broad and wide, okay? And, uh, and it's not like blue like the Danube is supposed to be, okay? It's, it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't go fast, okay? It's not, you know, you don't, you hardly need a boat to go across it to tell, <laughs> tell you the truth. In fact, our, our, our little Jordan, it kind of one meanders like this, you know, it kind of goes this way, and then it goes that way, and it goes this way, and sometimes, especially when we haven't had much rain, it gets down so low that the grass covers it. You can't see the river. I mean, I mean they'll, they'll bring you to the bath, they say, the Jordan River, and pe people will go out and look, go, oh yeah, oh yeah, the Jordan, the Jordan, okay, okay, <laughs> that's the Jordan, all right, whatever, you know. It's not, it's not a big river, okay? And, and this is exactly what Naaman saw. He, you know, he looked and he saw this little creek. And, and you know, it's not blue, it's not even green. It's really brown, okay? <laughs> and he looked at this and he said, dip seven times in that? You know, come on, you know, I'll need a shower after that, you know? This is, you know, this is not impressive. This isn't, this isn't good. And he, he, so he got, he got angry and he went away in a rage. But there's something about this man's Naaman. He has somehow surrounded himself with wise servants who love him. I mean, there's something really that truly is great about him, okay? Because the people that are closest to him obviously are devoted to him. The little Israeli servant girl, and now the servants that he brought with him. Here's, look what they say, verse 13. So then his servants came near, and they spoke to him, and they said, My father, my father. That's how you talk to the general when he's angry, okay? My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Because you're a great man from a great country? Wouldn't you have done it? How much more then when he says, wash and be clean? I mean, it's wonderful logic, okay? It's a, it's a beautiful argument. These are wise servants. They said, if he told you to do something magnificent, you would have done it in an instant. It would have honored you to do that. So he's told you to do something simple. So let's do it and go home, okay? <laughs> So, so Naaman listens to them, okay? <laughs> Naaman listens to them, and he thinks, okay, why not? So look, look in verse 14. So he went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now look, 
It took humility to go down to the Jordan. In fact, Yarden, the word for Jordan, is connected to the word Yored in Hebrew, which means to go down. Okay, you descend to the Jordan. You go down to the Jordan, okay? It took humility for a great general to go down there, undress, wade into this little, this little stream, and dip himself, not once, not twice, not three times, seven times, okay? So it was really, you know, you know that you've gone in the water when you do it seven times, okay? And so he went down the first time, comes up, still the same. Second time, still the same. Third time, fourth time, fifth, sixth, but on the seventh time, he goes down, he comes up, it's done. He looks at himself, and his skin is smooth and pink like a baby's bottom. He's, he's totally healed. It's a miracle. He, I mean, he just, I mean, you can imagine him. He says, I'm healed, I'm healed. It worked, it worked. I mean, he's beside himself. He just, just cannot believe that God has done a miracle in him. But... This man, once he got over the thrill and the joy and the exhilaration of being healed, he's wise enough to know that God is saying something to him. Okay, that it, again, we're talking about the purposes of God. He's wise enough to realize God has purposes behind this. And so he goes back to Elisha, and this time he sees the prophet. So look in verse 15. When he returned to the man of God with all his company, he came and stood before him. And here, here's the point of this story. Here's what was revealed to this general when he was healed. He stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So please take a present from him. He wants to give a give a gift to the prophet, which the prophet then refuses. Okay? Behold, now I know there's no God in all the earth but in Israel. And to show that he really deeply understands this, he then asks Elisha the prophet to pray for him. He says, okay, now please pray for me because I have to go back here. I have to go back to my home country. I'm going back to Damascus. And in Damascus, I may be a great general, but I'm not the king. So I still have to serve my king back in Damascus, and he serves idols. And I'm going to have to go with him when he goes into the temple of his idols to worship. I'm not going to worship them anymore. I know who God is, but I'm going to have to go with him because he's my king. So he asks the, the prophet of Israel, pray for me, okay, so that God won't hold it against me. All right? Isn't that wonderful? Okay, it shows that he really got it. He really got it. He says, I know there's, that there's only one God. It's in Israel. It had to be this God. It's this nation. It's this land. I couldn't have dipped in my rivers back home. God wanted, specifically wanted me to come here so that he would know it's this God. It's this land that this is what he's chosen. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it was a matter of God's sovereignty. He was bowing down, not to Israel, not even to the prophet, okay? He was bowing down to God. You see what I'm saying? The God who sovereignly made a choice and said, you need to go to Israel to get your healing, okay? And so God healed this Gentile by his grace when he recognized the uniqueness and the specific nature and the purposes of God's choice. Okay, you may say, well, that's the way God works in the Old Testament. Okay, that's, a, that's an Old Testament uh, story. Well, let's take a look in the New Testament. Let's look in Matthew chapter 15. Take a look in Matthew chapter 15, and let's um, begin reading in verse 21. For some of you, this, is, this will be a familiar portion of Scripture. Uh, for others... Maybe a difficult part of Scripture. I'll have to uh, confess to you, I've struggled with these verses that we're going to read for many years, okay? It wasn't easy for me as a non-Jew, as a Gentile, to come to grips with them. But I believe after a while, after struggling for a while, the Lord began to give me some revelation. I want to share what, uh, what, he's, what he opened up to me, to you, okay? Matthew chapter 15, let's look in verse 21. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. Does anyone know where Tyre and Sidon is today? It's in Lebanon. 
Okay, they're still cities, they're still Lebanese cities, okay? They were Lebanese cities in those days too. Of course, they called them Canaanites, okay? So he's, he goes out of Israel, he goes up the coast into the north, okay? So he's in Tyre and Sidon in Canaanite territory, verse 22. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. Okay, so what's happening here? Here's Jesus with his disciples and probably some followers, okay? They're up uh, ministering out of Israel in what is today Lebanon. And a woman from that region, obviously not a Jew, not a part of Israel, she comes out of the crowd and she begins calling out to the Lord. She says, Lord, help me. Help my daughter. She's cruelly demon-possessed. Okay, it's a mother crying out for help for her daughter. She calls him Lord. She calls him son of David. So she knows already who this man is. He's the Jewish master, the son of David. He comes from, he comes from the Jews. She calls him Lord. She's, she's submitting to him. Okay, we don't know if she knows that he's the Messiah or whatever she's heard, but she's, she's yielding to him, to, his, to his, uh, his lordship, and she's saying, do a miracle for me. She's heard that he does miracles. And the disciples are, are in a hurry. Maybe they're on their way somewhere. It's, it's, um, it's tea time or something. I mean, they're, they're, they're on their way, and they don't, they don't want to stop. You know, we already had our ministry time, lady. Uh, you have to come back later, you know, and uh, so... Uh, Send her away. They finally, finally, she just won't give up. She persists. She's shouting. She's beginning to cause a disturbance. And so the disciples turn to Jesus and they say, tell her to go away, okay, because she's, she's shouting at us. And this is because Jesus didn't respond to her. Okay, it says in the beginning of verse 23 that he ignored her. Jesus ignored her. Now, okay, that, that brings us to the question, why did Jesus ignore her? Okay, he'd healed so many people. He obviously heard her. She's not asking an illegitimate thing. She just, she wants healing for her daughter. He's healed many. She's calling him Lord. She's calling him son of David. Why should he ignore her? Here's what I think. I think he ignored her because he wanted her to get all of his disciples' attention. He knew something was going to happen that they all needed to see. Okay, so he just waited until she'd caused enough disturbance so all the disciples were activated, okay? And, and Matthew had his pad out, and he was taking notes, okay? I mean, that's when you know things are really going to happen, okay? I mean, really, you read Matthew's gospel, and don't you get the feeling that he took notes, you know, that he was there, he'd watch Jesus do something, and say, that was really interesting, and he'd write that down, okay? That's why his gospel is so, so accurate and so chronological, okay? So Matthew has his pad out, and Jesus is checking him out, okay, out of the corner of his eye. Now all the disciples are noticing this, okay? She's become an issue, okay? They're going to talk about it later in their discipleship uh, executive meeting, okay? <laughs> okay, so she's become, she's become an issue, and, and, and then he answers her, okay? But what does he say to her? Verse 24, he answers her and says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Ooh, okay. This is the Lord. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. He says to this woman, woman, you need to understand, I'm called to a particular people. God has chosen that I would come to the people called the Jews. Don't, do you realize that? Okay, do you realize that my ministry, and you know what? Jesus' ministry rarely took him outside of Israel. Okay, he was just, he was a very localized, uh, localized minister. He didn't travel internationally, as you would say, okay? His disciples did later. He says to this woman, do you recognize that my primary call, the, the focus, the functional focus of my ministry must be on the people of Israel, not your people? Okay, he says, I was called only to the house, lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she's not going to be put off by this. This is, we'll see later, this is a special woman, okay? Just as Jesus is the chosen son of God, this woman was a chosen woman, okay? And Jesus knew it. Verse 25. But she came, okay, after he says that, he says, lady, I'm not called to your people. That doesn't stop her. So she says, she came and began to bow down before him, saying, 
Lord, I don't care who you're called to, just help me. Isn't that what she's saying? Lord, help me. Okay? I know who you are. Okay? You're the master. You have power from God. If you have power from God, it's got to be for me and my daughter too. Okay? Lord, help me. Okay, now she's bowing down before him. Okay? She's broken through the, the, the cordon of disciples that have been trying to protect him. Okay? Now she's right in front of him. She's bowing down in the dirt. And she says, Lord, help me. Then Jesus says something to me that, I mean, this is really what caused me to really struggle for a long time. Because Matthew records, this is what he says. Verse 26. So he answered and said, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Ouch! Okay? I mean, really? Doesn't that sound to you like an insult? I mean, really? Here's this woman, again, with a legitimate request. She's not even asking for herself. She's asking for her daughter. Okay? She's coming. She's persistent. She's not giving up. Now she's bowing down. She's honoring the Lord. She's asking for a miracle. She's asking him to do what only he can do. He tells her first. First he ignores her. Then he tells her that he's not called to her people. Then he says, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He's saying, he's, he's saying who do you think you are to, to make a request like this? Okay? Do you think you're among the, the chosen? Are you, are you part of God's, of God's purpose? Now, I believe, as I said uh, a few moments ago, this woman was a chosen woman. She was chosen and anointed by God to be in front of the Lord on that day. Okay? The book of Proverbs says that the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue belongs to God. Okay? Now, if that woman had been me, okay, if I put myself in her place, I think I would have been shocked into silence by the Lord at that point. I mean, have you ever had an argument with a friend? Oh, okay, no one here. <laughs> or a family member? No one, you've never had, you've never had that experience. Okay, let's, let me just describe it anyway. Um, you know, you, you start, it's just, at first the argument starts as just an exchange of ideas, okay? Exchange of viewpoints. And then it becomes a little bit more personal than that, okay? And pretty soon, you know, you're, you're saying things that you didn't plan to say, and the other person is saying things they didn't plan to say that are more designed to, to hurt, okay, rather than to convince, okay? And then you get to this point of emotions are rising, voices are rising, you feel hot all over, okay? And then the other person says something so cutting, so cruel, so true, that, that you're just, uh, you're just, that's it, you know? There's no answer for that, and you're just shocked, okay? Into silence, and the argument's over. But an hour later, you think of the exact right words that you should have said. Okay? And you go, oh, what was wrong with me? You know, I, why, why, why was I paralyzed at that moment? I, that was ex I know exactly what I should have said. And, if I, and, and not only that, I could have said this and this and this and that and the other. You know, and you review the whole thing. Have you had that experience? Okay. All right. If I had been that woman, I think I would have been at that point, okay, if Jesus said that to me, okay? It's not good to give the children's bread to the dogs. I would have gone, uh, okay, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, all I wanted was, was a prayer from you. All I wanted was a blessing. You know, like, all right, disciples, take me away. You know? <laughs> you know, carry me out of here. Okay, it's over. I'm not going to bother you anymore. Okay? But not this woman. In fact, this woman has an answer for the Lord. Okay, let's look at her answer. It's an anointed answer. And the more I read her answer... I'm beginning to suspect there was a kind of a smile on her face, okay? I think it wasn't just the right answer. I think there was even a touch of humor in her answer, okay? Look what she says to Jesus, okay? <laughs> Verse 27, she says, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Okay, she's saying, I'm not going away. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, that's what she's saying, right? She says, I'm not going away. You're going to, you're going to heal my daughter. 
<laughs> okay? It's kind of like the woman and the unjust judge. You know, Jesus told, told that parable. She says, I'm not going away. You're going to pray, and my daughter's going to be healed. Okay? So then Jesus says to her, with all the disciples watching this and Matthew writing it down, he says to her, oh, woman, look in verse 28, oh, woman, your faith is great. Okay? Now, in other cases, he, would, he said, this is greater faith than I found in all of Israel. Okay? But today, he just said, oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And Matthew records for us that her daughter was healed at once. Okay, just like that. He says, okay, that was the right answer. Okay? And it will, shall be done for you as you wish. The king responded. Power went forth. The sovereignty of God was all involved, and the miracle took place. But what was happening here? What was Jesus trying to speak to his disciples? Okay, He's speaking to us today. God makes sovereign choices. Jesus said, I was called to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay? I'm the Messiah of Israel. Okay? Can you accept that? Yes, Lord, I can accept that. Okay? You are called. They're not my people. You've, you, God has chosen a people other than my people for his purposes. Okay? I can accept that. I can humble myself before your choice. Just like Naaman. You see, it was about laying down his national pride, laying down his personal pride to accept God's choice of someone else. Okay, there's a deep, deep principle here in terms of getting a hold of God's purposes for your life. Reconciling yourself and coming powerfully into God's purpose for you, God's choice of you, very often requires that you accept God's choice of someone else first. You accept that person's call. You accept that person's authority. You accept that person's administration over you. And in time, the day comes when they accept God's choice of you in your chosen calling and gifting. That's the way it works. So when Naaman accepted God's choice of Israel and that river and that land and that God, he was healed. And the same with this woman. When she said, okay, you're from another, the other people. You're from them. God chose you and them and not us. But surely, Lord, there's a blessing in it for us. When she humbled herself before that and refused to give up, it was done for her. Just like Naaman, she received her healing as well, and her daughter was made whole. So the principle is we need to recognize God's choices. And this is the secret behind the teaching of Israel. We're not talking about superiority. We're not talking about favoritism. Okay? We're talking about sovereignty, the sovereignty of God's plan, recognizing his choice and being able to flow with that, flow with God's functional purpose. Respecting God's choice of someone else is so often the key to finding and living in God's choice for you. So my prayer is that as we go into, these, into the rest of these messages, that we'll be able to look at Israel as a paradigm, as God's example, as God's instrument to bless the church and to bless the nations of the world. Okay, we want to examine Israel. We want to, we want to know about Israel, not because Israel is better, not because Israel is any worse, but because Israel is God's chosen means to reveal his purposes to you and to me and to the nations of the world. Let's pray. Lord, I ask your blessing now as we enter this day of teaching. I pray, Father, that you would help each one of us to reconcile ourselves deeply and genuinely to your choices. Help us to recognize the choices right around us, choices you've made in our families, choices you've made in our work, choices you've made in our churches. Help us to recognize and to see your hand, to look for your hand, to recognize your sovereignty and to accept it. And in the area of Israel, Lord, help us to recognize your sovereign choice of them. And as we do, as we submit to that choice, Lord, you will give us truth that applies directly to us and has to do with your choice of us, your choice of our nation, your choice of our church, our family, your choice of our vocation. 
We honor you today and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.